Hello, my name is Jeff Zuber. I'm the son of a Spitfire pilot and have the great privilege of being president of the Spitfire Association. The association was formed by pilots of the Royal Australian Air Force and we mark our 60th anniversary this year. My father, Cess, was a career pilot and I've inherited his love of flying, having been a private pilot for over 40 years, although my professional life was in the computer industry. This corporate experience guides my approach to the future of the Spitfire Association and it's this that I shared with my predecessor, Lyle Roberts. Lyle was the last Spitfire pilot to hold the position of President. It was our shared corporate experience which resulted in the vision of the Spitfire Association that is today working to help Australia remain resilient. Our founders understood that their service during World War II didn't end there. Pilots like Lyle, Edward Ted Sly and others founded the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship in 1998 as a living memorial which today carries that spirit forward. The association has a long-standing relationship with Defence. Today, this is reflected in the patron of the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship being Chief of the Air Force, Air Marshal Mel Hupfeld, AODSC. It's my pleasure and privilege today to spend some time with Mel. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you here today and to talk things Spitfire, Spitfire Memorial Fellowship and aeroplanes generally, Australia and our future. Yeah, it's great. Um, really looking for forward to the, the anniversary of the Spitfire Association and uh, it's remarkable that this year is such a big year for Air Force, our 100th anniversary, our centenary, uh, and uh, an opportunity where we're recognising you know, 350,000 uh, people that served in our Air Force over 11,000 of those that didn't make it home. And, uh, and within that, there's a number of um, our aviators um, uh, from the past that, uh, that were a part of those numbers. Yeah, so it's, there are some huge numbers. Uh, there's a, a very well-known photograph of G for George and you see all the crews that didn't make it home. Uh, people think about a single aeroplane, but uh, it was a number of aeroplanes and a lot of our Australians that lost their lives. And uh, that, that sense of needing to be ready after the war is what drove my predecessors in the Spitfire Association because they would lived through it and they knew that uh, everything that they could do after the war was going to count to keeping Australia uh, as one of the great nations in the world and resilient into the future. Mm. A remarkable bunch of people uh, and what an amazing legacy they've, they've left for us. Uh, and uh, we still talk about the remarkable things they achieved, the feats that they, they achieved, um, um, the, the absolutely um, generous things that they gave us um, without any real thought to it. Uh, they just instinctively did it because it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it wasn't just during the Second World War, as you say, but it was after that. Uh, and to still give selflessly uh, right through their lives um, for the security of this nation, I think, is, is really quite amazing and, and well worth remembering and, and celebrating uh, on, this, uh, on your 60th anniversary of the Spitfire Association. Indeed, on our 60th anniversary, yes. the 85th of the, uh, the Spitfire itself yeah. and 100 years of the Royal Australian Air Force fires. This table, I noticed that uh, uh, um, it is magnificent. Tell me a little about how this came to the office. So this was a uh, complete surprise for me. Um, uh, one of our squadrons, uh, 65 Squadron, the, the Air Base Reconstruction and Recovery Squadron, um, and they... Uh, for the centenary, they made this table out of out of black butt timber. Um, they put it through a laser milling machine. Uh, and were able to produce the the uh, Royal Australian Air Force crest that you can see on the table here. And uh, they sent me out of the office just immediately prior to the the 100th birthday on the 31st of March. Um, there aren't I'll, many people, Mel, who can send the chief out of the office. No, that's right. Um, well, my staff out here can. Uh, so they, they told me how to work from home uh, that day. There were a few things that they needed to get done. Uh, when I returned to the office the next day, uh, there was a group of the, the, uh, the technicians, the, the tradesmen that, that built this table, they were all in here. And uh, they'd carried the table up. It weighs a tonne. Um, but it's absolutely beautiful quality. quality. Um, and for, for that, uh, the quality, the intent of the table to be delivered by our Air Force people, just a great demonstration 
of what our people in our Air Force have been doing for many, many years. And the work they've done now represents uh, a table that will take our Air Force in the office of the Chief of Air Force through until our se into our second century. So, so this is the, the hundred year table that will last in this office for another hundred years 100 at years. least. That's right. That's remarkable. That's the plan. It, it, it's, it's beauty and the beauty of the work. Uh, when I came in, I looked at it and I thought, well, in many ways, this represents some of what the Spitfire uh, is about. I mean, you look at that aeroplane and um, it is for something that was designed to be so deadly to allow our young men mm. to uh, uh, dispatch their young men more effectively than they could the other way around. Today we think about the Spitfire as something beautiful, mm. but in that, uh, in that beauty it served so many purposes and, and uh, that I think carries forward to the Air Force today, doesn't it? Yeah, I think uh, certainly the Spitfire to me is one of the most elegant and beautiful airframes. I mean, I'm a fighter pilot, so I love fighter aircraft. Um, I did have a model of a Lancaster in my bedroom uh, when I was growing up. Um, but the Spitfire, um, nimble, agile, you know, fast, um, a, a dynamic performer, a true fighter. Uh, now, I've had the privilege of flying a Mustang. Uh, and the Mustang's, um, you know, it's very, it's, it's rock solid. Um, you can tell you're flying a fighter when you're flying the Mustang. I haven't flown the Spitfire, but I imagine that it's just that little bit more nimble, uh, a bit more flighty. Uh, so quite a remarkable aeroplane at a really important point of innovation. Um, you know, born of war um, and up against an adversary in the Messerschmitt um, ME109, I think, was its, its one of its primary uh, adversaries. And the technology that the Germans put into that aeroplane was quite phenomenal as well. But between the two of those, we had just um, you know, amazing aircraft and the Spitfire held its own well and truly in that regard. It did, and, and it held its own from well before the war till mm. well after the war. The flexibility mm. of that aircraft and the ability to, I think, have more than 30 versions of a single aeroplane, um, in that way it stands on its own. I don't think any aeroplane has had that many versions mm. of, the sing of, of that same airframe, that flexibility, that remarkable aeroplane let it take on many roles and in that way is a lot like the F-35 Lightning II today. You know, people think about the Spitfire, as you say, as a fighter. Uh, my father, who was a Royal Australian Air Force Spitfire pilot, flew them as a dive bomber predominantly. Yeah, yeah. No one thinks about the Spitfire as a dive bomber or something that will strafe targets or do photo reconnaissance. Yeah. Uh, they think about the Spitfire as a fighter interceptor, but it did all of those things. It did all of those things, um, I think, remarkably well and I think it's that uh, that corollary to the Spitfire of yesterday, yesteryear that is today very much what the Royal Australian Air Force does and continues to do with the F-35. Mm. Yeah and you can we can probably talk a bit about the F-35 a bit later if you like but uh, the, you know the way the the Spitfire was was developed and 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 truly innovated all through its life that life of type uh, and as you say multi multi-role um, I think uh, strafing targets on the ground, and it was very, very, very effective in, in that sort of a role. And, and you know, there's some similarities between what it represented and, and what the F-35 now represents. Although I think the Spitfire is a far more attractive aircraft than the F-35. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you can see that uh, in, a, in a short space of our history of aviation, um, you know, 100 years of Air Force this year. Um, uh, just over, you know, a few years over, a hundred years of military aviation. Our air force was formed right at the start mm. of the development of, of air power uh, to, to provide a military application. So the Spitfire, um, you know, developed not very long after we first started flying aeroplanes. Mm. Uh, and when you look back now at the Spitfire and the technology in that aeroplane, and compare that um, through to what we now operate with an F-35, uh, you know, another. Uh, you know, 70 odd years later, the technology is, is amazing in terms of its movement forward. You know, in the 100 years of military aviation, we've gone from fabric and, and spruce wood um, through to millions of lines of code and carbon fibre and advanced manufacturing technologies. Uh, but when you look at the Spitfire, um, you can see the nature of, of um, people and what they can bring and how they can think and, and find a solution to a problem. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's alive and well in our Air Force today and it's um, our forebears that have really given us that um, from the start. Uh, the flexibility of the aeroplane and 
uh, uh, and our forebears four and, and the grounding that they gave us to then spring forward. Um, whether it's what we're trying to do in the Spitfire Association, the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, for which you're our patron, uh, or whether it's what we're trying to do in the Air Force, it's the understanding that the grounding that we start with um, is the basis for our ability in all sorts of ways to then move forward and that grounding comes from the things that we do as organisations, the work that we do with industry and I think the broad church, uh, the Spitfire and that era in the Second World War, uh, people think about uh, the innovation that we do today in, in a social and engineering sense. Had we not had many people in industry as well as those people that flew the Spitfire in combat. There were women who flew mm. the Spitfire to deliver it. Yeah. Uh, there were women who worked in the factories. There were women who were in the design of the Spitfire. One very famous one, Miss Schilling, her brilliance was in that woman's understanding of the physics and the mechanics. Uh, and so what was done then and that broad church of society, I think uh, today we, we take from that and we do more today than we've ever done. Mm going back to the sorts of things that were done to win a war where the whole of society was involved across yeah. the entire Commonwealth. Yeah, and certainly um, that's kind of evidence that war is a national endeavour. Uh, it's not glamorous at all. Uh, I can come back to that. But the uh, diversity that was um, probably unknowingly included during the Second World War, and as you've said, um, as, as an example, women flying the Spitfire, not permitted to fly them in combat, but flying them in equally challenging circumstances as they flew them from the factories where they were built to deliver them to the frontline squadrons. Uh, but really uh, uh, remarkable in what they could do. Um, but I'd also uh, take the opportunity just to talk about um, the Spitfire, even then, as the sort of the leading capability. Uh, certainly the Battle of Britain is a good example of that, um, with the hurricane as well, of course. Um, but uh, the, the forcing function of war really drove innovation in a whole, whole range of different areas. And the Spitfire, even then, was part of a system. Um, it was the leading system that could fire and employ the weapons, um, really where the rubber hits the road. But um, many people that were uh, working radios and maintaining radios, uh, the table plotters that you'll see in plenty of the World War II films, um, a lot of them women, yes. um, that were contributing to the combat scenario to defend the nation, uh, and of which the tip of the spear was the Spitfire. And uh, so that, that sort of parallel is, is very much evident in our Air Force today as well. Now, we're a much more diverse Air Force than we were back in the Second World War uh, era. Um, and we train female pilots now who fly combat aircraft. Um, and I expand the nature of combat to not just be the fighters that we have, but our C-17s, our C-130s, the P-8, uh, they all fly into the face of danger uh, with crews as diverse as, as we have ever seen in our nation, uh, ethnically diverse, culturally diverse, um, um, gender diversity, uh, but all of these things that come together um, with the same value set. Um, to deliver what's really important for the secure of our nation. Uh, it happened um, in the UK in the early days of the Spitfire. It happened in Australia. The Spitfire flew and defended our, our nation back in the Second World War here in Australia and up in the north. Uh, that, that logic, that concept, those people, how they think, their values, um, very much alive and well today. Yes, yes, it's important to be Australian, and I think being Australian captures and enshrines a lot of the things that you've talked about, and and then to to uh, embed that in the Air Force today and what the Air Force does, uh, and and the recognition that the right person to to drive a, a piece of capability or to undertake a job, um, the right person is the right person. That's not about uh, whether they are of a particular ethnic background or, or in fact whether they're men or women. And as a man with four daughters and two granddaughters, you might expect I've got some fairly yeah. straightforward views about yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and, and I'm very proud of all of my daughters, uh, one who works for Defence. Um, the, the, the view that you're taking and that the Air Force is taking in terms of getting the best result uh, is, is it's very encouraging uh, for me personally, it's very encouraging for Australia. And I think in, in terms of, of how we do that and the research and the, the uh, um, 
the way we bring industry to bear, because without industry and without the support of industry and R&D and industry, mm. we don't make those leap, leaps forward. Mm. Um, in, you, in your view, uh, what's the role of industry as we look towards the future? Mm. No, industry is a huge part. Um, and I think uh, if I once again go back to the, the development of the Spitfire, it was a forcing function of war that did it. Uh, it was military driving these innovations. Um, but now the, the pace of industry, uh, the pace of thinking, uh, modern thinking, and Australians, I think, um, have, we have a great um, wealth of innovation and, and people that are willing to take some risk and have a crack at something, you know, having a go, you know, it's, it's kind of part of the Australian culture. Uh, so industry now is racing ahead with a number of innovations that we can apply into the military field. Um, and uh, so we see some of these things, um, you know, drone technology, um, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, there's any number of, of applications of, of systems that we can apply and make us more effective. Um, and in some cases bring us asymmetric advantage. Um, and that's what we're increasingly going to have to look at. Uh, the world's a very different place um, even to 10 years ago. Uh, you know, we're talking about the Spitfire from the Second World War. Well, even as recent as 10 years ago, the world's changed a lot. And I think we'll continue to do so. The, um, very much the nature of a competitive environment um, uh, the nations that are flexing to challenge what we might regard as a, as a rules-based global order and the balance around the world, um, we as Australians and, and with like-minded partners uh, really uh, work hard to uphold um, fair and open um, access to all parts of the world, fair and op open um, following of, of rules that have been internationally agreed. Uh, so certainly that's the case in our region, uh, that's, a, that's the case around the globe, uh, and indeed it's becoming the case in the, one of our newest domains, uh, newest to us in terms of how we're influencing it, but has always been there, and that's the space domain. Um, so industry is a key part of that all the way through, and even more so now as we start to expand the ability to operate um, far more broadly than we ever have done in the past. In helping Australia and helping the Air Force, and how does uh, how do things like the Spitfire Association and associations help to draw industry in to uh, help accelerate the speed that we need to keep not up but keep ahead in, in key areas and, and how do we work with, with the Air Force to do that? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, communications, um, a key part of uh, what industry can provide for us. Um, the, the, the ability to bring a, a number of systems together, to integrate them, to have them being able to operate as a whole. Uh, so that systems of systems approach, um, architectures in our uh, um, information technology uh, that allow us to be very adaptable and build, build equipment that can plug in anywhere. You know, it's uh, simplest example is your iPhone. You know, you, it, we've all got the same iPhone, but we can put a different app on our phone to do a different task. Uh, so I know uh, I've got lots of apps on my phone to my wife's frustration. Uh, and uh, she just wants one, the one that rings, lets it ring, ring up a friend. But it's that sort of an approach that industry is bringing us world leading capabilities that allow us to be far more effective as a, as a military fighting force. Uh, and to get to um, the ability to ideally shape, deter and respond before we have to get to conflict. So you've used the word before about, you know, what's war look like now? Uh, it may not be violence. Uh, you know, there's commentators that talk about winning without fighting, and that's that era of competition. Uh, it's about that um, operating below the threshold of conflict. So we, we are seeing that. Uh, so how do we use our military capabilities nowadays to be able to, to operate in that way, to make sure we shape, deter and respond in accordance with our government's objectives, um, so that ideally, we don't get to the next level of, of uh, conflict. Uh, we avoid military conflict or violent conflict. Uh, we don't want to get into another war, um, as we've seen in the past. So our own credibility and our ability to deter is one, one way. And, uh, and if we can use these capabilities and the industry-supported technologies, um, we put them in the hands of our amazing people, uh, they'll innovate, they'll find, find a way to do it, they'll be the ones that will shape uh, they'll be the ones that engage and communicate and they'll be the ones that ensure that 
um, uh, any, anyone out there that, that thinks they might want to question our values, um, we'll be able to explain to them uh, you know, what's the right way to do things. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting when, when you were talking about uh, uh, industry and the role of industry and looking forward, if I, if I go now and look back to mm. the founders of the Spitfire Association uh, and in fact the founders of the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, mm. uh, they were a, a relatively small group of of Spitfire pilots who saw that their contribution during the Second World War uh, made a tremendous difference. And as you mm. pointed out, many of them paid the ultimate price. They didn't come home. Those that did realise that what they'd done in the war had to be carried forward in the stuff that they did through the Spitfire Association. And they worked very passionately and actively to to make sure that as individuals and as an association and then in 1998 through the fellowship to actually do stuff that could make a material difference to Australia and the defence of Australia. So the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship uh, which was set up in 1998 was about making a difference, a contemporary difference. So what they had done uh, then became a contemporary difference that they felt they could make through their experience and, and their knowledge to help Australia remain resilient. And it didn't stop there. When Lyle Roberts, my predecessor mm. and our last president, who was a Spitfire pilot, I'm just the son of a Spitfire pilot, when he handed me the baton, he said, Jeff, you and the association and patrons like Mel and Mark Binskin, uh, your predecessor, carry that spirit forward. Uh, do what you need to do to make sure not only we do what we're doing today in the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, but we expand on that. Um, how important is that sort of stuff to what it is you're doing and your thinking? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's, it's really important. Uh, and there's a number of associations that contribute to this. Um, you know, the Williams Foundation do some work for us. Um, uh, uh, they're... And they're foundations that operate differently to the Spitfire Association and certainly the Spitfire Memorial Development Fund. Um, that fund itself is, is, I think, truly remarkable. Uh, and it's about giving people opportunity. It's about building that core of people that I've spoken about earlier uh, that get an opportunity to innovate, get an opportunity to look and think. Um, and the fund, and I've got some examples of some of the fellowships that the Memorial Fund has, has supported. Um, but Really, I think it's about carrying forward the vision of people like Lyle and, and those veterans that fought in the Second World War. And I think their aim was to, um, you know, in perpetual um, memory of the Spitfire, uh, but to do something useful that would um, contribute to the security of this nation. And I think their aim uh, was to do it uh, by making sure that we never had to go and fight like we did in the Second World War. So, you know, what can we do to make ourselves stronger, better, shape and, you know, enable our defence force and a whole of government approach to shape, deter and, if necessary, respond? Uh, and they've done that through funding some of these fellowships. It's about um, uh, targeting, if you like, um, people in the industry already uh, and give, giving them an opportunity to, to uh, further progress their ideas. But it's also an avenue where the younger generation can see this and we, we actually progress and develop, you know, that thing called yes. STEM. Yes. You know, science, yes. technology, engineering and maths. Um, and people that may not have an opportunity uh, otherwise to put their ideas forward and, and maybe develop a solution that's world leading, that, that could make the difference between us being able to secure our values and our national interests without having to go and fight for it the way we had to in the past. Indeed, indeed. If we look to what we're trying to do through the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, as well as the other efforts that we're now beginning to bring mm. up out of the ground in terms of raising money and looking to do things to help Australia remain resilient, uh, one of the things that's not well known, well, the, the Memorial Fellowship today is not well known. We need to change that. Mm. We need to draw people, clever Australians, to, to do things that help us, to help you yeah. in, in defence. What's not also known, I think, is that it's not just about uh, Air Force stuff. The Memorial Fellowship has people who have done work on hydration and the effectiveness uh, other, or otherwise of being under or over hydrated. Mm. Its application, for instance, to Special Forces. Uh, there are people who are looking at cyber. There are people who are looking at space fellows as well. There are some uh, who are looking at how, how do we uh, put capability out on the oceans 
or uh, and I think uh, one of them in, in the sky that give us a very broad coverage mm. uh, and make a difference for what you're trying to do through their fellowship. So in, can you talk a little about some of those fellows and the things that you've seen yeah. over the years? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's one, I've got an example here, um, uh, Dr. Bianca Capra. Um, and recent yeah, and she, um, you yeah, know, remarkable aerothermodynamic sort of work, and I'm not technical at all in, in understanding this, but it's uh, it's really linking into a key program that we've got coming forward as well, and that's the hypersonics program. Uh, so uh, Australia is, has got some world-leading thought in, in the hypersonics area, um, and uh, there's a couple of reasons we might want to do that. Um, the first is that there's, there are other nations that have hypersonic weapons and we want to be able to understand hypersonics so we can defend against them. Um, and of course if we need to we, we would uh, be looking at hypersonics as potentially weapons application in case we needed to employ them. Uh, so she's doing world leading research um, through our science and technology area uh, that's uh, helping us to work with our key partners uh, in industry uh, and other nations to try and progress some of these outcomes. Uh, so that, that's quite a remarkable opportunity that the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fund uh, Fellowship has, has really given as an opportunity there and uh, to give someone in our community a chance to excel and in so doing actually provide outcomes that support the security of our nation. Another one of your staff, Wing Commander, Kieran Joyce. He's. Mm. All, uh, uh, I call him Mr. Loyal Wingman. Yeah. Uh, he he, yeah. he drives a lot of that program for you, and, and he was a Spitfire fellow. And I've got the great yeah. pleasure of having Kieran on my committee as well. The thing that we're trying to do, and I think now succeeding to do, because Bianca's uh, reference was Air Vice Marshal Kath Roberts, and so mm. uh, Defence and Air Force are now taking a very first-hand role in who they want involved in the fellowships and helping guide us uh, on that because you know what you need. We have a fellowship and unless we put those two things together, we don't create the results for you consistently that we need to create and we don't draw people in in the way that we need to draw them in. Um, so with, the, um, with that as an example, um, uh, you said that we know what we want. Well, we do, but we also don't know what we don't know. Uh, so people like Bianca can give us ideas, uh, things that we won't have thought of, and that's the beauty of bringing independent thought into the area. Uh, you mentioned Kieran Joyce. Uh, he's an ex-army officer, yes. and uh, he's very much specialising in the, the uh, UAS area, Armand Aerial Systems. Uh, and uh, we saw an opportunity for him and the expertise he brings to coming to Air Force, so he's now a wing commander in the Air Force. But I still can't get used to him in the blue uniform. Yeah, yeah. He looks better in his blue uniform, I've got to say. Mel. He does well. But, I, you know, I, I, and, and I say that with a degree of pride, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to bring some element of diversity in, in an army candidate, an army officer, in and wear a blue uniform, that's a good thing for, for the Joint Force. Yes. Uh, and indeed, our Air Force was born from the Army. So uh, the um, Australian Flying Corps was a part of part of our army to begin with uh, and then we we gained and separated as an individual service uh, in 1921 yes. so uh, that historical link is still there um, and I think Kieran's a living part of that and he brings an immense amount of expertise and experience uh, and that innovative thought and well enabled by the the Memorial Defence Fund it's uh, it's, a, it's a, been a great opportunity for us um, and him it's a great opportunity for us as well because these people who've been fellows often do stay with the Spitfire Association. Mm -hmm. uh, Mel, um, as we at the Associate Spitfire Association look forward, we've thought about what we need to do. Uh, Lyle Roberts and I developed uh, a plan in terms of our future, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of thinking that we needed to do both in terms of the Memorial Fellowship, um, how we stayed relevant and continue to carry forward that, that memory of, of these men and women, uh, and what we needed to do not only for, uh, for the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, but those things that work around that in terms of other programs we're working on. Um, um, as we at the Associate, Spitfire Association look forward, we've thought about what we need to do. Uh, Lyle Roberts and I developed uh, a plan in terms of our future, mm. uh, the sort of thinking that we needed to do both in terms of the Memorial Fellowship, um, how we stayed relevant and continued to carry forward that, that memory of, of these men and women, 
uh, and what we needed to do not only for uh, for the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship, but those things that work around that in terms of other programs we're working on. Um, what does the future look like for the ADF? Certainly, uh, you know, in our near future, um, the, the recent Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure Plan gives us a pretty good idea of what the Australian Defence Force will look like in a decade. Uh, all we have to do is work well with industry to deliver. Um, what government has committed to, and certainly government has committed the funding to deliver, uh, and the things, the capabilities that we need in order to secure our nation. Uh, and that's, yes, that's equipment. There's a number of those that are equipment, but it's also about our workforce and preparing and training, um, professionalising, uh, building strategic acumen amongst our people so that they not only um, know what they need to do, but they need, they'll understand why they need to do it. So. Uh, the, this sort of a w work that we're doing and the work that, that you're able to support us in doing, um, every little bit helps. So that's, you know, that's where we're going in the next decade or so. Um, and I think that's a, you know, I, I can sit in this seat and I can see that as a realistic future. Uh, what comes after that? What's next? What's the sixth generation of fighter aircraft? You know, we've gone from generation one as the Spitfire up to fifth generation F-35. Um, what's the next generation? What does that look like? Um, I asked the question when we were looking at the replacement for the Hornet. Will it be an aircraft? Now, it is, it's an F-35 at the moment, but you know, we're developing Laura Wingman, of which Karen Joyce is, is, is contributing to as well. Um, Laura Wingman is an un uncrewed aeroplane that will team. Uh, we'll have a number of them that'll team with each other. To swarm and go somewhere the, is the sort of vision we have. It'll team with the F-35, it'll team with an E-7 and protect an E-7 as, a, as another piece of uh, capability. Um, so, uh, Sorry, an E-7 mil for, for is those the, people that might be yeah, watching who, who good question. Are, like us are not, not necessarily <laughs> steeped in, in these things. So the E-7 is our wedge star which is the airborne early warning and, and control aeroplane. It's the one that's got that funny top hat along the top of the fuselage. The 737 with the 737. big long thing at the top. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, those those systems, uh, you know, having a, a law wingman with it to protect it, um, you know, would be a great way to deliver capability. And that's that's not too far off either. Uh, outside of that, um, you know, solutions from space, um, any number of other options we could see coming out there. But the heart of all of this will remain uh, the people who are going to think and operate. We can talk about artificial intelligence maybe replacing some of those functions and that'll be a key part of our capabilities moving forward. Uh, but we'll never replace people. People still have to design the artificial intelligence. They still have to provide the means by which artificial intelligence can learn and then become autonomous and, and function where it's appropriate. But still be accountable and responsible so that we have disciplined application of capabilities, including up to lethal force if we need that. So uh, people will still be involved and have to be involved in ensuring that we fight ethically, that we can deliver capabilities um, with discipline, with precision. Uh, so all of those things in the future, what, that's, that's something that won't change. Uh, the means by which we do it, um, you know, outside of the next decade, you know, in fact, probably out of 50 years, that's about the life of type of the F-35 you know, after that, what's next? Um, you know, what, what, what will it be like here at the end of our second century? Yes, um, yes. What yeah. will this table see at the, yeah. at, the, at, the, at the second century? We'll have a few scratches on it, I think, by then. But uh, as long we'll as I don't it. put any on, that's no, okay. That's right. <laughs> we'll have heard a few conversations too. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, you know, the classification uh, by which we actually manage all these capabilities now is is only getting more important that we protect it. Uh, so with cyber, uh, other things, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, and very skilled in how we operate and uh, having systems that can help us to protect. So it's a, it's a very broad um, nature of capabilities that we'll see in our future. I just want to pick, on, pick up on something that you said a moment ago there. You used the word uh, 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 ethical and I think one of the things that defines Australia and I think back to the conversations with my father uh, and with Lyle, uh, they were sometimes troubled by the things that they had to do uh, because they were part of the job that they had in hand. Uh, they knew though that in doing that they were doing a job 
that was uh, ethically correct. They didn't have things that they thought about as they got older, um, oh, I wish I hadn't done this or I wish I hadn't done that from an ethical standpoint. It's one of the things that defines our country and I think uh, is is defining the way that we shape our defence force and our air force. Um, can you make any comment on that? Mm. Yeah, I, well, I'd probably go back to where we started the conversation, Jeff. Um, you know, we talked about the beauty of the Spitfire, um, uh, how beautiful it is to fly. Um, but it's a weapon of war. That's the fact. Um, so uh, any of our systems that we operate in the military now are for that purpose as well. Um, in, our, in our current force and what we will be developing in the future force. Uh, so where necessary, our role is to deliver lethal force if it's required. If we can avoid doing that, that's much better. And the romantic nature of the Spitfire is alive and well. Uh, you know, as a kid growing up, reading Biggles magazines and um, you know, seeing all that stuff, it was very romantic. I always wanted to be a fighter pilot. It looked like a lot of fun. Uh, but there's no glamour in war. Um, it's quite horrific. Um, Having flown F-18s in the Middle East, a very small part of what I think some of the horrors that um, your father and Lyle Roberts would have seen. Um, but they went out there and did it. Now, uh, we have, I think, far more precision. Um, we have capabilities that allow us to be um, uh, very clinical um, and precise in how we do it. And, and, in, and the, the elements of discipline are still required from all of our crews the where we operate. Uh, so that's, that's something that won't change. Um, I think governments are better prepared to provide good, clear intent and guidance and policy. Uh, and now what we have to be able to do as members of the military is know how to employ in accordance with those policy settings. It becomes very important for us. Um, it's a, that is about being ethical. Um, and Australia, is a, we, Australia um, value the values we have and what we believe in is a free and open um, environment and following the rules. And uh, those rules are, you know, they're good, good guidance for people. They're things that make sense because we've, people have learnt hard lessons from them in the past. Uh, so, uh, you know, operating and functioning in accordance with those um, makes sense. And if we do that um, uh, um, deliberately and carefully, then um, ideally we will lead, we won't get to miscalculation and we won't get to conflict um, and we won't, won't be called upon to use uh, violent force anywhere. And, and and have this country remain as the wonderful place that it is. It's it's uh, the pride that comes with calling yourself Australian. There is something special about that that the world recognises. They can't quite put their finger on it, mm. but I think our ethics as a nation are an important part of that and the way that we deal with each other, whether it's our citizens or other people around the world. Yeah, yeah I think um, Australians are generally law-abiding. Um, the COVID situation at the moment, um, <laughs> I think part of our success has been because people, they do what, do what they need to do. Um, and, uh, but a key part of that, and certainly within the Air Force, is um, we explain to people why. Uh, if they can understand why, that makes it a lot easier for, for them to do their job. Um, speaking of, of, of doing the job, uh, what can we do at the Spitfire Association and the Spitfire Memorial Defence Fellowship that, that doubles and redoubles what we can do to help you and help Australia? Yeah, um, stay engaged. So stay engaged with Air Force. Um, stay engaged with Navy, Army as well. Uh, and as you pointed out, the fellowships provided opportunities in the multi-domain environment. So yes, we have Navy, Army, Air Force, they're environmental organisations, but we all operate across the domains of land, sea, air, space, and the information and cyber domain. So um, continue to engage with all of us. Um, continue to present the opportunities for, for younger people, for academics, for, for innovative thinkers to bring their ideas forward and have a conversation. Um, we need their support to be able to achieve everything that we've got planned for our future and everything that we don't know about yet that we'll need to adjust for our future. Uh, so, uh, organisations such as the Spitfire Association and the, and the, um, the Moral Defence um, Fellowship really do provide an opportunity that's not easily found elsewhere, and it's those opportunities that continues to progress our nation to their future. Yeah, I think, uh, Mel, my predecessors, people like Lyle, my father, would be very proud to see what 
we're achieving together because without the input from you and from Defence, uh, it's almost impossible for us to do our job effectively. Uh, I'm enormously proud of, of what it is we're doing and, and uh, uh, a mixture of uh, absolute terror and huge enthusiasm for the future that we've set ourselves in the association uh, and look forward not only to continuing that with you but also seeing you at the Spitfire Association 60th birthday. Yeah, no, um, absolutely, Jeff. thank you. Uh, great having a chat to you today. And, uh, you know, to celebrate uh, those that came before us, you know, the Air Force Centenary is about then, now and always. Um, Spitfire Association and the Moral Defence Fellowship are a perfect example of that. And when I look at those young men and women that fought during the Second World War, um, I now see the people we, the young people we have in our Air Force and those that the Fellowship is enabling, and I have, I have no doubts that we'll be able to do what's required of us in the future. And, uh, and it's thanks to uh, um, uh, your father and Lyle and people like that that set up the association and your energy to keep doing it and all the rest of your, your members in the association that, that will uh, continue to ensure that we've got the right people um, that can do what's needed for our future. Uh, Mel, the pleasure and the privilege is ours and thank you very much for giving me the time today and to talk so broadly about so many topics. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you at the dinner. Look forward to it. Absolutely. Absolutely.